host for this presentation. We want to welcome you to online information session, Help Us at National Disasters during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I just want to go over a few housekeeping um, rules for us so that everyone can get the best out of all that we are sharing today, that everyone can and hear all the great information that you're going to receive from um, all of our guests. And let's see. So first things first, if you can mute your lines, please. So it, to mute your lines, you should see a microphone um, in the little chat box there or in a little line on your screen. That microphone should have a line through it go ahead and make sure that that microphone has a line through it um, to mute your lines. I apologize for my dogs barking in the background, um, but if you can mute your lines for us, please. Also, this is information for you. Feel free to take notes. Please um, write down any questions that you may have. Um, we want you to ask questions. We want you to um, get all the information that you can and make sure that you have clarity in that information. So please be sure to write down any questions that you may have. We are going to designate a time at the end of the presentation where we will be able to address questions individually. So you will have the opportunity to actually share your questions with everyone or throughout the presentation, you can also share your questions in the chat box. Where is the chat box? The chat box is located right there on that same little bar that your microphone is located in. You can find the chat box by locating the little box that has the icon that looks like a notepad. A matter of fact, let's go ahead and test that out. If you can, go ahead and click on that chat box and what you can do is share with us where you are actually joining us from what city and state and also share with us exactly how um, share with us exactly how you can um, or how you found out about the presentation. All right. So with that being said, um, we're going to go ahead to find out what the purpose of this meeting is. So the entire purpose of the meeting, once again, welcome. We're going to review the mission of the American Red Cross as well as our fundamental values. Um, we're going to preview our 2020 hurricane and wildfire seasons. We're also going to discuss Red Cross National Disaster Relief Operations and temporary volunteer or opportunities at mass care shelters during COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to discuss those expectations through that as well. The great thing is we're going to introduce you to some key volunteers as well as some key staff that's available to support you and answer any questions you may have about volunteering with the Red Cross across all lines of services. So you're going to hear from a lot of different people um, that's going to share some information with you, some valuable information. And we're also going to help you get started on a Red Cross volunteer experience. Are you guys still able to hear me? Yes, we are, Monica. Yes. OK, awesome. All right. So um, as far as presenters are concerned, I introduce myself. My name is Monica Wilds. I'm Volunteer Services Senior Specialist um, here for Southeastern Pennsylvania region. Some of the great um, speakers that you're going to hear from as well would be Matthew Bridenstine, for Disaster Cycle Services Volunteer Manager. Um, we have Ned Bloom, Volunteer Services Senior Specialist. Ned Lynn Cohen, Volunteer Services Senior Specialist. Janice Thomas, Volunteer Disaster Cycle Services Regional Mass Care Lead. 
And Ray Owens, Volunteer Disaster Cycle Services Regional Disaster Health Services Lead. And I don't know if you heard, Siri was trying to assist me in this presentation. <laughs> but these are all the individuals that you're going to hear from during the presentation um, that's going to share some great information with you so that you can figure out what we do, who we are, how you can assist us, and um, even more information as well. So let's talk about the mission of the Red Cross. With the mission of the Red Cross, the American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers as well as the generosity of donors. This is central to everything that we do. Um, everyone that's here definitely holds this close to them whenever we do anything on behalf of the organization to help our communities. It's central to our volunteers, central to staff, um, as well as other partners um, with the great works that we do. And this is our guiding principle, if you will. In addition to that, our fundamental principles are humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, unity, universality, and voluntary service. Why did I leave volunteer service last? Because 90% of our workforce is volunteers. We have not, we cannot, and we will not do what we do without the help of our volunteers, without the willingness of our volunteers to give freely of their time and their talents to share with us, to help us fulfill our mission to serve the community. It's central um, and, and very important to everything that we do and we could not, simply could not do it without you. Gail McGovern is the president of the American Red Cross and she shared a very, very um, interesting and poignant quote uh, just recently. She stated, we are here for a singular purpose to alleviate suffering. Red Crossers are humanitarians who see a need and they in turn need to fill it. This is our culture, which has stood the test of time since Clara Barton founded our beloved organization. We have the culture in place to make a difference. And in fact, we do that every day. As I've often said, the American Red Cross is a beacon of hope. And that quote is so profound and that it embodies everything that we stand for, everything that we do. We are one Red Cross from our services to our staff to our volunteers. We all serve the same purpose. And we hope that you will want to join us. We are going to present some information for you um, to hopefully help you make that decision. So please don't keep this to yourself. Be sure to share with your friends, your family, your network, let them know that we're sharing this information right now so that they can join you as well. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to my colleague, Matthew, who's going to share a little bit more information with you regarding the 2020 hurricane and wildfire season, as well as some other great information. Matthew, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Monica. Um, welcome everybody, uh, good afternoon. So um, with, with this part of the presentation, I'm going to set the stage with what we could be dealing with uh, this summer in terms of uh, natural disasters. So the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration is predicting above normal 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. So they are forecasting a likely range of 13 to 19 named storms. These, these are storms with sustained winds of 39 miles per hour or higher. So within those 13 and 19 named storms, uh, they're predicting six to 10 will become hurricanes. And these are storms, uh, 74 miles per hour or higher sustained winds. And including with that three to six, they're predicting will be major hurricanes. These are storms that are very destructive. These are storms with 111 
miles per hour, sustained winds are higher. And I want to put things in perspective of what we may be dealing with. In 2017, it was one of the most destructive active hurricane seasons in recorded history. There was 19 named storms altogether. And when you think of the named storms, uh, you know, Irma comes to mind, Maria comes to mind, and Harvey comes to mind. In 2017, between June 1st and today, July 16th, there was only two named storms out of those 19 storms that uh, was uh, encompassed that whole hurricane season. This year, this year, we've already had six named storms in that same time frame. So you could see that if this trend continues, we may be dealing with um, some major storms impacting the continental United States that we're going to have to respond to. Now, 2020 is on track to also be one of the hottest and driest years on record, um, with the exception of the Pacific Northwest. We're seeing um, precipitation below average in June, pretty much across the country. As a result, we've already seen um, increased fire activity in the uh, southern, western part of the United States. So, if you're combining an above normal hurricane season and an above normal fire season, there's a very high likelihood that the Red Cross will be responding to the possibility of multiple um, disasters simultaneously, much like what occurred in 2017. Now, we're facing another challenge that we as a nation haven't faced in over 100 years which is this pandemic. And that has proposed some challenges to the Red Cross. Some of the members of our workforce who would normally respond to these large disasters fall within that vulnerable, uh, susceptible to um, severe illness due to COVID. So they're gonna sit out this, this year. That is why we really, really need your help. We really need people like you to step up join us, take the required courses, and get out there and support those communities who are going to need our help. In an operation, it takes, um, sometimes it takes hundreds of volunteers all across the country with various skill sets um, to make uh, the, the mission happen. And you can be part of that mission at one of the most critical times in Red Cross history. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? So when the Red Cross responds to disasters such as hurricanes or wildfires, our mission is to work with our government and nonprofit partners to address those immediate needs caused by a disaster. These include sheltering. So whether we need to open up a shelter to provide uh, a safe place for people to weather a storm or um, an evacuation, or whether the event has already occurred and they've lost their home, we would provide that immediate need of sheltering. We also provide health and mental health services and distribution of emergency supplies. These are items essential to the basic survival and meet the specific and urgent needs of disaster affected communities. So some examples of supplies are food, water, it could be hand sanitizer, baby formula. Um, it could be supplies to help up with cleanup and recovery, you know, like bleach, work gloves, mops, buckets, those types of things is what communities rely, our partners rely to, to provide in times of, of large scale disasters that you would be deploying out to. So again, um, it, takes, it takes many people for this to happen and we really, really could use your help in joining our team and helping our communities in such a, a unique time in our history. Um, I'm sure many of you We'll have questions and we'll I'll you know field those questions at the at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And now um, we're gonna pass it on to my colleague Ned Bloom, who's going to share some of those specific um, opportunities with you regarding the disaster relief operations. So Ned, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Matthew. 
Uh, and everybody, thank you for joining us today. As you heard, my name is Ned Bloom, and I do work in our volunteer services department. I started as a volunteer myself about 10 years ago, and I've been on a number of deployments. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the nitty gritty of today's presentation. We're going to talk about the four volunteer opportunities that are available for you to get involved with the Red Cross. And as Matthew said, this is a different year for two reasons. One, we're expecting a very, very busy season. And two, we have to operate under the COVID-19 environment. Regardless of those facts, the mission of the American Red Cross goes on because of our volunteers, and because of outstanding people such as yourself. So again, thank you for the consideration. So what happens? Let's talk about that. Hypothetically, we know a hurricane is coming and it's going to hit Smithville, Alabama. I just made that sound up. But because of forecasting and technology, we can prepare and we know where that storm is going to land. We will start moving supplies, goods, equipment, and personnel, not to, not to where it's going to hit, but nearby towns. Let's say that town has to be evacuated. They're voluntarily or by mandatory reasons. A lot of these people may go to their friends and families out of state, but many of them are going to go to a Red Cross shelter. Fortunately, we have agreements in buildings across this nation where we're ready to accept our shelter needs and shelter clients. Because of COVID, of course, we can't put everybody in one shelter. We need to spread out. That's going to spread our supply chain out. That's going to require we have more people, more coordination. And we've been preparing for this for many, many months. So when we open up a shelter and we use local volunteers first, because they're already boots on the ground, then the call goes out around the nation. And I got to tell you that this part of the country, fortunately, we don't get a lot of mass care destruction here. But our volunteers in the Pennsylvania area, the Philadelphia area, are known throughout the nation as being some of the best volunteers who respond to these disasters. And we're going to call to call out to people that are trained, who people that are already been vetted, who people we know can help during these disasters. And they're going to help at the shelter. They're going to help in a registration area where we capture important information to help people get back on their feet. We're going to set up a dormitory. We're going to set up pots, blankets, pillows. These shelters already have gotten invented and they make sure they've got shower facilities, cafeteria facilities, restroom facilities. So we know that we can house people there when it's absolutely necessary. I said I worked at one of my very first shelters I ever worked at, 24-7 operation, as all shelters are. And I worked overnight and people were coming in all night long, sometimes with just the clothes on their back. We had to register them, get some information, assign them a cot, assign them a blanket pillows, help them get a warm shower and some food. It's a remarkable experience to work at a shelter. So we need shelter workers to take on some of these responsibilities and we need shelter supervisors to help everybody coordinate and be on the same team. I have the opportunity now to introduce one of my favorite volunteers, Janice Thompson, who has been a volunteer for the Red Cross and has worked on operations such as this. Janice, if you would be so kind as to share your story, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Ned. And good afternoon, everyone. I've been a volunteer with the Red Cross for three and a half years. During that time, I've gone on two, her, de, sorry, two deployments. My first was in 2018 to North Carolina for Hurricane Michael. We landed at the Raleigh-Durham Airport and our shelter that we needed to get to was in the southeast corner of North Carolina. And with a lot of the roads flooded, we had nowhere to get there. So they called in the National Guard and we arrived at the shelter by a Black Hawk helicopter. And I wow. have to admit, that was fun. My first time ever on a helicopter. Last year, I was down in Georgia for Hurricane Dorian. Uh, no Black Hawk helicopter this time. But the experience you gain from each deployment and knowing you are helping people during the worst time of their life is very rewarding. Plus, you make so many friendships with fellow Red Cross volunteers and employees that after you return home, you keep in touch with all your new friends. There are several jobs that, like, uh, that are available in a shelter. You may be registering people as they enter the shelter. You may be assisted, assisting and feeding. A very important job in a shelter is just having a shoulder to lean on or an open ear. Remember, these people just lost everything they have had, and now um, the only thing they have is what they brought to the shelter. Disasters can also happen in our region, the south, 
eastern Pennsylvania region. Earlier in May, we opened a shelter at a hotel in Philadelphia for a multifamily fire. This year, with the, uh, the Red Cross is trying to use more hotels, university dorms, and only if they have to, school gymnasiums with less people in the shelters because of COVID. I can assure you that after you take the necessary training and become a shelter worker for the Red Cross, you will find it very rewarding and knowing you are helping people during their worst time of their lives. Uh, thank you, and I hope you'll consider joining the Red Cross. Janice, thank you. That was wonderful. And, and that's a remarkable story about the Black Hawk uh, delivery. Um, flexibility is rule number one with the Red Cross. And whatever it takes to accomplish our mission, we will. You also mentioned that you meet great friends when you're on a, a, a disaster response. That is true. I've met friends years ago that I'm still in touch with. No two operations are alike, but having the training, having the protocols in place helps you when you meet other members from around the Red Cross, from around the nation, you can then all work on the same team. Friends of mine tell me, hey, Ned, that's so fun. You get to go to Louisiana or Florida or California. It's not a vacation, folks. It's a lot of hard work, but it's the most rewarding work you can Im imagine. Two of the other positions that we have available at a disaster relief operation include healthcare operations. Okay, imagine we've set up a shelter in a church basement or a school gymnasium. We have to also set up a medical area, a sick bay, if you will, that is staffed by medical professionals to help with minor situations, cuts, scrapes, bumps, and bruises. If there's a more innate, if, there, if the need is more emergency, they're gonna help transport those, those people to a healthcare facility. We're going to help keep people's medication, maybe in refrigeration, help them replace any medication. We have got to take care of our clients, their physical well-being. And for this, we need disaster health services associates and, again, supervisors. You work within your licensing, and you make sure that people's health is taken care of in a shelter. Ray Owens is a gentleman who I've had opportunity to work with. He's a phenomenal volunteer. And I'm going to ask Ray to talk a little bit about his experience as a disaster health services volunteer. Ray? Hello, all. Uh, welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as Ned said, I'm the regional disaster health services lead for uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. I'm a retired RN and military veteran. I was looking for something to do and occupy my time after I retired and came back. And uh, lo and behold, I was watching TV. I saw an ad for the Red Cross, uh, was watching the news about Hurricane Florence uh, heading towards the U.S. And uh, contacted the Red Cross, applied online. And one week later, I was in North Carolina working at a shelter uh, in a very impoverished area devastated by floodwaters. I uh, stayed there for about two weeks uh, and then left North Carolina and headed directly to Florida for Hurricane Michael. Uh, and was sent to a high school with 240 clients that was destroyed by 150 mile an hour winds. Uh, there was virtually nothing standing in the area. There was no electric, no water, no internet, uh, pretty much nothing, uh, except for the people that needed our help. Uh, so we replaced medications, we replaced uh, medical machinery that they needed, uh, we took care of the bumps and bruises that they had, we filled uh, prescriptions for them, one gentleman had walked 30 miles uh, to get to us, to get to a shelter, and along the way, he had been bitten severely by fire ants. Uh, so we took care of him and uh, finally had to send him to the hospital, and we found transport to take him all the way back to Tallahassee, which was about a 60-mile drive, because the hospital where we were was shut down due to the, uh, due to the hurricane. Two weeks later, I returned and I was asked by my chapter folks uh, if I wanted to be the chapter lead, uh, which I said yes to. And four months later, I was asked to be the regional lead. And I never looked back and never regretted the, uh, the decision. Uh, training. There are four short courses uh, for staff associate. That's the first level. And then there are uh, a total of six courses for a supervisor, as long as you have some leadership experience. And um, they're short courses, they're not hard to take, and they're all online. We're looking for registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, nursing students, medical students, physicians, certified nursing associates, uh, and pharmacists. There is a 14-day commitment, 
However, in Hurricane Michael, it was so devastating. We needed a lot of health care providers. And so that time was shortened to a week. Um, it's like a puzzle. If you look at all the components and all the people working and all the areas that they're that they're working in, and you have to put all those pieces together to make the puzzle work. So if you are interested in problem solving uh, and you like puzzles, why are you waiting? You should hop online and apply now. Believe me, I've been an RN for 40 years and I spent 33 years in the military, and this has been my best experience ever. Ned, back to you. Thank you, Ray. That was that was fantastic. And and Janice, thank you as well. I mean, everything we do around a disaster relief operation, these four positions, shelter worker, shelter supervisor, disaster health services supervisor, and disaster health services worker, these are all volunteers and we need you. Of course, we've also got to, you're not gonna do it without help. We've got a whole teamwork of people to help you and a lot of support. We're going to talk about those expectations and the things that we actually help provide you along the way. And for that, I'm going to turn it back to Matthew, who's going to tell you about some of the support and some of the things that we help you that you can help do this job. Matthew? Yeah, thanks, Ned. So, yeah, and before I get into expectations, I just want to reiterate uh, what, you know, what Janice and Ray um, experiences compared to my experiences, which was the same. Um, one of the most fulfilling experiences I've had in each one of my deployments, and I've met uh, people from all across the country, all ways of life that I've befriended, and I am still friends with to today. And you, you really do get an opportunity to help people at some of the worst times of their lives and, and, and work with them and make it a, a better situation for them. So some of the expectations are, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through the main ones. Um, ability to leave within 24 hours. So you know, once you take the courses, um, you will have um, you will have a volunteer connection account where you will provide your availability to to deploy. What does that mean? That means you saying, OK, I can um, deploy, let's say, from like August to September. You know, you have that window of time that you're available. And when an opportunity arises, we pull up the list of all the people who said that they're available. And we start going down the list and we call them. So, you know, what I strongly suggest you do is when you put your availability in, that you take into consideration that we're going to ask you to deploy within 24 hours and you know, plan accordingly. Um, deployments for this season are going to be 14 days. You, there may be an option that you can extend deployment while you are there. You know, th that's that's discussion. Um, oh, is my camera not on? I am sorry. Thank you, Susan. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, you, you may have an opportunity to um, extend your deployment. That's a discussion that you and your supervisor will have, and they will approach you if there is that need for you to um, to extend. And, and you get to decide the parameters. You can decide whether you want to do it, and you even get to decide Maybe it's only for three days, or maybe you can extend it for a week. It's up to you. Red Cross does cover the flights and the expenses of one checked bag. Um, this is flights to the operation and back. And we provide you with a mission card. Um, this mission card is like a debit card. We load about $300 onto it, and it's be used for expenses. When you're going to be deployed, you're mostly going to use that card for like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, pretty much for food. Um, shelters, like Ned said, and Jan said, operate 24 seven. Um, they're consecutive days, multiple shifts, and sometimes shifts can be 12 day, 12 hours long. Uh, and you will have an opportunity to get a day off. Typically it's one day every um, seven days. So because of COVID, um, we are going to try to house people in hotels if at all possible and each person would have their own hotel room um if that is possible where we can have a hotel now keep in mind we're going into a disaster so there might be a chance where 
all the hotels are occupied because people have lost their homes and they're in the hotels or the hotels have been destroyed themselves. There is a slight chance that you may stay in a, uh, a, in a congregate um, staff shelter and we have procedures in place to keep our workforce safe in this environment of COVID if that uh, does occur. But again, Red Cross is trying everything we possibly can to ensure we don't get to that point. Um, but the main point is, is, is being flexible. Um, when you return back, you will receive a performance evaluation. You will also have an opportunity to provide feedback on your experience. And, and lastly, I just want to say this. Um, you're going into a disaster. It's, it's not a vacation. Um, you know, you're, you're, you could be deployed into an area where infrastructure may be destroyed. Um, so the work can be challenging and it can be stressful. But we have, um, we have professionals there that can support you during your um, deployment. You may experience some chaotic environments. Again, it, it could be long hours. Um, you know, rapidly changing information and directives is a possibility. So my point is, is go into this knowing that to be flexible. The more flexible you are, the more you're actually going to enjoy the experience and actually perform your job better. So again, I'm sure you have plenty of questions and I'll feel free to uh, definitely answer those questions at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Back to you, Ned. Thank you, Matthew. And that's very well said. Flexibility is an important rule and knowing what to expect. We can't do this without volunteers. You lead us every way. In a best case scenario, there are no hurricanes, but it's paramount and it's upon us to prepare and be ready and help you be ready. And I see some great questions in the chat box. Please keep those coming. We are going to address those questions at the end. Of course, in addition to being available to help on a disaster relief operation, Red Cross is a 24 7, 365, 50 state operation. We have operations that are also local to home. And are there opportunities to get involved? In the Red Cross, either before deployment or after deployment. So the point is we want to find something that fits your schedule, fits your interests, fits your availability. My friend Lynn Cohen is going to tell you about some of those opportunities and hopefully one of these will fit for you. Lynn? Lynn, if you are speaking, I'm afraid you're muted. Thank you, Ned. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, it's been a great presentation so far. Don't you think you've learned a lot about the different kind of deployments that you could be sent to and the different kind of experiences you could have? So if you're all about adventure and helping people and um, being logistical and adaptable, this is definitely a role for you. Not only in the time of COVID and during the time of um, what we call operational states and disasters, we also have opportunities uh, locally for our volunteers. So we respond to more than 70,000 disasters a year as the American Red Cross, and that includes house and apartment fires, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, hazardous material spills, transportation accidents, explosions, and other natural and man-made disasters. So you can see that um, our organization is very busy and we're there to help. In the last nine months in our region alone, we responded to 718 home fires and other disasters providing assistance to over 3,000 people. So in addition to doing all these wonderful things in the time of COVID and deploying, there are things that you can do here uh, locally to get trained um, for being an ongoing disaster responder to help with those home fires and to, jo jo to join a disaster action team. 
Um, there's also always um, help needed cleaning the emergency response vehicles. Uh, you could always offer translator services in the event of a disaster. Um, sometimes we ask our volunteers to participate in mock disaster exercises or a shelter exercise hosted by a particular chapter. So there's lots of ways to get involved with disaster, even if you aren't interested in exactly deploying. Another very high need that we have here at the Red Cross are is in our biomedical services department. We are always looking for um, screeners, especially now during this COVID time, ambassadors and drivers. So we have different locations. So typically we have mobile drives and we also have um, fixed sites that folks can donate at. So our fixed sites are in Northeast Philadelphia Willow Grove, Westchester. Um, so if you're interested in uh, helping out at a fixed site, you can do that. But then you, there's all kinds of blood drives every day around our region, and we would love for your help on that. Typically, the drives are Monday through Fridays, and you only can, you can pick whatever drive is like convenient and closest for you. Um, in the last nine months, these are the last statistics I have, PA, our, our region collected over 107,000 um, blood donations. So we have different um, opportunities. As a screener, you would be someone who would just be helping take the temperature, greeting our donors, thanking them so much for you know coming in today, make sure that all the uh, established safety protocols are being uh, completed and followed. You might be asked to help and a support at the registration desk. At, as a donor ambassador, uh, you can manage the registration desk and the reception area. Again, it's greeting each donor, um, assisting them with the initial intake process, staff the hospitality and snack area. Um, you would also, you know, learn to alert staff immediately if any volunteers felt signs of not feeling well. We also have blood transportation specialists. These are driver positions and these are very important positions because after we collect the blood, we definitely got to get it somewhere. So you might be asked to transport blood from um, our Philadelphia based uh, fixed location to some local hospitals. You may be asked to help transport um, the blood from a uh, center uh, back to the Philadelphia our Spring Garden location or specifically to a hospital. So that um, is a very, very, very important job and something we could use a lot of help with. Um, our next line of service that we're going to talk about today is volunteer services. So we are, um, Ned, Monica, I um, are part of our volunteer services program. And we have lots of different roles available from financial services to operations and leadership positions. Uh, you may want to help recruit volunteers or do community outreach. So we're not really doing a lot of like face to face community outreach right now. That's why we're having our virtual presentations due to our COVID environment. But hopefully if we ever get back to normal, community outreach folks go out to different events and host tables and engage and talk to the volunteers or potential volunteers about different opportunities that are available in their interest and invite them to register to become a volunteer. Um, we also have opportunities for volunteer appreciation and recognition team members in all of these different service departments and in financial services, you may be interested in supporting fundraising or special event efforts. So one of our biggest uh, events that supports the American Red Cross in our region is the Red Ball, and that has been postponed until April of 2021. But um, if you're interested in helping, you know, garner um, prizes for that event or in-kind donations and that's an area that you love working in um, you can always support us there so as you can kind of see no matter what you want to do um, we can find a place for you here at the american red cross and as it's been stated before yes 90 percent of our workforce are volunteers we cannot function and do all the wonderful things we do in the community and save lives without your help we appreciate our current volunteers who continue to take on more roles with us, and we love engaging new volunteers who want to help and support our mission. 
So with that, I'll go to the next slide. So this is kind of a roadmap of what happens when you're applying to volunteer. This is specifically um, related to applying at our website. So you can go to redcross.org backslash volunteer. You can also download our smart app on your phone. So if you go to whatever Play Store it is for your phone, I, iPhone or Android, um, search Volunteer Connection, and this app should come up. You can even apply from your phone uh, to become a volunteer. Log your hours, um, select shifts, all kinds of things. So after you submit your application, you're going to get an email and they're going to ask you to sign up for a screening call. So this is just a, a call from one of our fabulous volunteers from our intake team who talk about the next steps, um, advise you if there are any background clearances or if you need to have any credentialing information, like if you're an RN or something that they need to get a hold of. Next, you'll learn about, <clears throat> excuse me, the training that's required. So with the COVID positions right now that we were talking about today specifically, uh, the training is self-paced and online, but those must be completed to continue to move forward in the process. So once you've completed your training, you're eligible for the deployment process. So again, as those positions we talked about today, the shelter workers, supervisors, healthcare professionals, this is the point when you would receive the call and be expected to deploy um, within 24 hours. Then you go to your deployment and after your deployment, we have what we call, as Matthew talked about before, the out process where we want to know, you know, we want your feedback. We want you to conduct an evaluation for us because we always want to learn what we can do better. We always like every experience is different. So we're always looking for, you know, um, folks to let us know what we could change up and, and how we can make the experience better for the people we are serving and the volunteers that are working with us and, and serving. Um, then we're going to follow up with you, just kind of see, you know, how things went, and we would really encourage you to stay involved with us. So, like I said, there's over 500 probably different volunteer opportunities that you can do at the American Red Cross. You can do more than one. Um, it's all up to you. You know, we cater to your schedule we are flexible we're adaptable we have to be and um, if you have any you know questions about any of the other opportunities you can reach out to ned myself or monica and all that information will follow but you know thank you to everyone especially our volunteers on today ray and janice really appreciate that Matthew always explains things so very, very well. So um, just thank you everybody for participating today and sharing and hopefully you'll be interested in joining us. Thank you. Okay, okay Lynn, thank Lynn. you so much for that. And you guys, wasn't that some great information that we just received, not just on the organization, our mission, our fundamental principles, principles, information on the different volunteer opportunities and how you can get involved. So now we want to share with you who you can contact. You're going to contact the volunteer services specialists in your area. Once again, as I stated, if you're not from southeastern Pennsylvania, don't fret. We don't mind getting you in contact with the person or the um, the chapter that's in your local community. So as far as local contacts are concerned for southeastern Pennsylvania, you could contact myself or Philadelphia County. Once again, my name is Monica Wilds and you can email me at monica.wilds at redcross.org or you can contact me at 215-299-4803. Once again, that's 215-299-4803. If you're in Chester and Delaware counties, you can contact Lynn at lynn.cohen at redcross.org. Or you can reach her by phone at 610-216-9785. Once again, at 610-216-9785. 
five. And last but not least, if you live in Montgomery or Bucks counties, please contact Ned Bloom. Ned's email address is ned.bloom at redcross.org. And you can reach him by phone at 570-417-5608. Once again, that's 570-417-5608. Eight. And as Lynn stated previously, you can always complete your volunteer application right online at www.redcross.org forward slash volunteer. And if you're not in our region, this um, application, this actual website will be able to give you the opportunities that are available in your local area and your application will go directly to your regional um, volunteer services department. So once again, we're one Red Cross and we're all here to assist you in coming on board to help us fulfill our mission to the community and help serve those in times of disaster. So now's the point in the presentation where we would love to hear from you. We would love to hear any questions you may have, any comments that you would like to make, suggestions, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go um, to the questions in the chat box first and see what questions are there. Um, I'm going to ask Sarah, Sarah, are you on the call? Okay, so if someone is available to read, um, Jordan, Jordan, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm on the call. Awesome. So Jordan, could you share any questions that may be posed in the um, chat box? If someone has already answered them, please share the answer as well. And if they haven't been answered, um, I'll go ahead and, and uh, get someone to answer the question. All right. Um, well, Stacy just asked, can you walk us through the online training process? Okay, awesome. So Matthew, I'll share that with you. If you can assist Stacy and Stacy, great question. Thank you for that. Yeah, sure. That's a really good question. So when uh, you go through volunteer services and you know you're approved um and it gets to the time where we give you your trainings um we will give you a list of trainings for you to conduct through a platform called edge and these are all online courses that you can pretty much do anytime so that we made it really really easy for you to um get the courses done and for you to be able to deploy out quickly so we give you the list. We will give you the link on um, this online platform for you to conduct the courses or complete the courses rather. And um, and we um, we will when you complete the courses, we will know that you've completed this. Monica, if I may add, this is Ned. Um, the reason we ask people to take training is because that way you are better prepared. And the fact of the matter is, when you do go on a deployment, you're going to meet people from Michigan from California, from Texas. And this way, everybody's been trained the same way. Everybody's working on the same procedures. Everybody knows the same words and knows how to work together. It instantly helps build that team if everybody has the same training and then you meet all your deployments. It's easy, it's online, you do it on your own self pace and uh, it really does help you prepare and be work as better as a team. I absolutely agree, Ned and Matthew. Thank you so much for those that response to that question. Stacy, thank you for that question. It's very, very good. And I'm sure other people had that question as well. Jordan, are there any other questions in the chat box? Um, there was a question earlier um, from Matt. Uh, he said, how does it work if you have a medical license for a state other than for which you are being deployed? And Ray responded, um, that health services is based on an RN model and we only disperse over the counter meds. So as long as you have a current valid license, you are covered. Okay. Thank you for your question, Matt. And, and next then there was, there was one more question from Matt also who asked, is any type of medical liability insurance necessary? 
to which Ray responded, not really, as long as we practice within the scope of practice allowed by the Red Cross, you don't need liability insurance. We are covered by the Red Cross. That said, it's up to you if you'd like to carry your own. Awesome, awesome. And does that conclude the questions in the chat box? Yes, there's no more questions right now. Awesome. So now thank you for everyone that shared questions in the chat space. I'm going to ask now if you have a question, if you could raise your hand um, that you may have thought of now, um, just raise your hand in, and we'll go ahead and as answer that for you. You can ask it now. Be sure to unmute yourself. And I'm going to ask for assistance because I can't see if anyone raises their hand. No hands raised. All right, so no fret. If you guys did not get an opportunity to ask a question, you think of it a little later, uh, just always you have the opportunity to email one of us um, to get that answer. If we don't personally have the answer for you, we will get that answer for you. All right. Oh, Monica, one question yes. in the chat yes. from Christine. It says, do you need health insurance to participate on deployments? Matthew. Uh, the short answer is, is no, uh, you do not need health insurance to, to deploy out. That's not a requirement. Thank you for that question, Christine. All right, so you guys, thank you so much for taking this time out to share with us, to um, hear the different information that we provided for you. Um, our volunteers that share such wonderful personal insights and giving that firsthand um, account of what it is to be a volunteer with the Red Cross and in this space. Um, my colleagues that shared information on the how to get involved in what to do. Um, we appreciate you. We appreciate you taking this time out of your busy day to share a little bit of time with us and to learn more. Before we leave you, we would like to leave you with this quote from um, Mr. Rogers. And he said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And you guys are the helpers. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't have a desire to help. And we thank you so very much for your willingness to help. We appreciate you. If you need us, please feel free to reach out to us. Don't keep this to yourself. Be sure to share this information. Share it with your friends, family, and your network. Be sure to visit us on our social media sites, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, we're present on all of them. And also, you will receive a copy of this presentation shortly hereafter. Um, we will email you um, to let you know when you can access that. So we thank you once again. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you all of our presenters. Please have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Monica, before yes. you go, you have some more questions and you have a hand raised. Oh, yes. thank you. Shelly Beasley has her hand raised. Shelly, hello. I apologize. I can't see any hand raises. <laughs> that is, that's fine. Um, I have done my application. Um, they've done the background check. I'm not sure if that's back yet. I've had the interview with my local chapter here. Um, and then I was told during that interview that they are not outboarding at this time. Um, is there any way to check with, uh, I'm a teacher and so I'll be starting school in about a month. And so I'll be checking on things during the weekend, during the school year. But um, I just wondered, is there any any other way to check on? I don't. I mean, I I'm uh, I'm sad that there's no outboarding at this time. I guess. Where are you located? Um, I'm in Rochester, Minnesota. 
Okay. Um, Susan, are you on a call? Would you like to take that? Okay, I don't think Susan's on, but who would like to take that that question there? Matthew, do you know any? Yeah, I, 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 could, I could definitely take it. Um, so, you know, right now we don't have anything major going on, so that's why those opportunities don't exist. But we definitely are predicting that there will be some major disasters this summer. Um, so what happens is, and also, wait, let me take a step back. It's also situational. So, for example, when a hurricane is coming, we have some um, some time to prepare, and our volunteers will will have more of a, a chance to to know that hey, they might be able to be asked to deploy out. But if there is a tornado, or let's say a wildfire that happens that happens like that, right? Those things are pretty quick. And there's no way that we can notify everybody in the country that an opportunity is available right there and then. And also, we, we try to go local first and then okay. spread out from there just because it's, it's more um, convenient. It's, um, it's just more efficient that way. So that's why we really ask uh, our volunteers, just go in and put your disaster availability into Volunteer Connection. And what okay. it's called door, when the door opens, for opportunities, we know who has the training, we know who's available, and we will reach out to you. I know you want some, you know, some leeway, but it's just with disasters, it's just really, really hard to do that. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you. And I would like to also add, um, one of the beauties about volunteering with the American Red Cross. So as Matthew stated, you know, it's kind of a, a door with disaster, you know, once the disaster happens, um, after they go locally first, they expand beyond that. But while you're waiting, um, if you've completed all your training, et cetera, if you want to volunteer in the organization, speak with your volunteer services department and we can find or help you find something to serve in, somewhere to help us while you're waiting to be called out to deployment if you so choose. So you don't have to just do that one opportunity. You could be assisting us in another area while you're actually waiting. Okay, thank you. You're so welcome. Did you guys say there was another question? There were some there questions were. in the chat earlier. A little, a couple more. OK, we can uh, go ahead and read them. Mm -hmm. So Luz asked, will we be tested for COVID before deployment or during? And then uh, Matthew said, hi, Luz. No, you will not be tested, but we will have screening questions before you deploy. And then Sylvia asked, once you are approved, how long are you in the trainee position? To which um, Matthew responded, you would be in the trainee position until you have completed the courses. Awesome, awesome. And do we have any other hands raised? Mm -hmm. No, we're, we're all that. good. <laughs> awesome. So I do want to, I did see a special guest in the room not so long ago. I don't know if he's still here, but I'm going to put him on a spot. Guy Triano, who is our regional um, CEO, he was in joining us earlier. Guy, if you're still here, would you like to add anything or say hello to everyone? He may have to step away. All right. I don't see him in the chat, Monica. OK, awesome. Well, thank you guys so very much. Once again, we appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. And please enjoy the rest of your day and your week. And don't forget to contact us should you have any further questions. Bye bye. Bye all.